Welcome everyone. Welcome to the first ever Lyme Innovation Roundtable at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. A few housekeeping logistics before we get started. Um, first, I'm Kristen Honey. If you have any questions, ask me or anyone with a green dot on their name tag. All the volunteers uh, who can answer your questions have a green dot. Um, also with social media, we encourage you to use it today. Um, tweet about this morning session, uh, put it on Facebook, whatever you want. People um, can watch this online at hhs.gov slash live or on the HHS Facebook live stream. After the event, uh, HHS will put it on the YouTube channel so people will be able to view the morning session at their leisure. We're using the hashtag Lime Innovation. Um, second thing is that um, at some time today, if everyone could get a black Sharpie and sign that poster way in the back, we're asking everyone to come uh, together today, a very, very diverse group of stakeholders, and this hasn't been done before. So we'd like to record your name as being part of uh, rewriting Lyme history and uh, dealing with um, tick-borne diseases as a community together. So we're rallying around our shared purpose and that poster board uh, hopefully will have everyone's signature by the end of today. And then lastly, if you're looking for restrooms, they're out there to the left. If their lines are too long, you can take the elevator um, up one floor, get off the elevator, and then you would take a right. Um, so I think with that, um, let me just set some ground rules for how we're going to operate today. The morning session, we will have talks by government leadership, as well as industry experts. The rest of the afternoon will be hands-on, late, late morning and afternoon, will be hands-on working sessions where we have uh, seven different tables of about 10 people each rolling up their sleeves through a structured, facilitated uh, series of, of um, breakout groups, breakout sessions, and you will be driving towards a question, that it, an answer to a question, and each one of you individually will think about if, um, if you had three minutes with the, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, what near-term actions would you take to move the needle? We have tables dedicated to prevention. We have tables dedicated to treatment. We have tables uh, dedicated to diagnosis and also to an all-hazards table, uh, which you'll hear a little bit more about later today. The ground rules for today is that we want to create a safe space for all these diverse views to be heard and to be respected. So around the room, you will see some signs that have seven different values, and these are the norms of how we want to operate today. First is respect. Everyone is valued. Second, innovation, shifting the paradigm and finding a better way. Next, honesty and integrity. Find the truth, tell the truth. Excellence, quality, real world, world evidence underlies decision making. Compassion, finding solutions to relieve suffering. Collaboration, uh, work with citizens and patients as equal partners. And lastly, accountability, the buck stops here. So with those, those values uniting you, us all, want to create a space where essentially everyone is equal. It doesn't matter if you're an MD, PhD, or if you're a patient with lived experience or a caregiver who has, has lived with or knows about this disease through a different lens. We also have experts here from different fields. Some may uh, study cancer and are new to tick-borne disease. So this is a place where all those different perspectives are equally valued, and we encourage everyone to speak up and not be afraid or intimidated by all the credentials in this room. Now, it is my pleasure to welcome Ed Simcox, the HHS Chief Technology Officer and the Acting Chief Information Officer. Ed's office today is hosting this roundtable. Prior to joining HHS in 2017, he worked at the intersection of healthcare and technology for over 18 years. Uh, he had leadership roles at AT&T and Logicalis, and he engaged with healthcare providers across the United States and has been a longtime advocate of liberating health care data for the American people. Welcome, Ed. Good morning. 
it's a pleasure to be with you this morning. Thank you for uh, coming out uh, and being with us today. At the Department of Health and Human Services, we are tasked with improving the well-being of all Americans. In the office of the CTO, we focus on spurring innovation across our healthcare ecosystem here in the United States. And our office has the ability to convene multiple groups of stakeholders to solve pressing health system issues by using innovative techniques. And nowhere is the potential for innovation greater than in tackling chronically overlooked and underfunded health issues here in the United States. One of the areas uh, where my office has seen some great progress uh, in using innovation uh, to tackle issues is with chronic kidney disease. And we are currently engaged in an innovation accelerator called KidneyX. You can go check it out at kidneyx.org. Through KidneyX, we're looking at completely changing the diagnosis and treatment of kidney diseases. And this is an area that for a long time has not seen the attention that it deserves. Like kidney disease, Lyme has existed for decades with little improvement in diagno diagnostics and treatment. Also like kidney disease, specific market failures have plagued Lyme treatment with minimal innovation. And this stagnation has created an environment offering little hope and a lot of frustration for patients. Luckily, complex health challenges are exactly what my office likes. Sitting in the immediate office of the secretary, we have the advantage of being able to create innovation strategies that span multiple agencies here at HHS. And HHS works best when our sprawling agencies, each with their own individual, very important missions, work in collaboration to solve these complex health issues. With KidneyX, we've designed an initiative where the FDA and CMS and others are aligned toward a common goal. And this synergy allows us to drive innovation much faster. With Lyme disease, we're interested in taking a similar approach that recognizes that innovation requires specific financial incentives, payment options, and regulatory flexibility from the government. This means working across silos to build new partnerships. The power of public-private partnership could also be brought to Lyme disease. Such a partnership could bring together the expertise and resources of a private organization with the authority and oversight of the federal government. The core of these partnerships is the prize authority granted to us by Congress. Prize challenges bring together insightful new ideas from diverse areas that would otherwise never be engaged by either the government or the private sector. Prize challenges allow us to look at the art of the possible and provide a new avenue for innovation. As data is becoming central to almost everything in our world, we must ensure that innovators at all levels have access to more data. And this is especially true in healthcare. Today, even after years of improvement, far too much data remains locked and siloed across agencies and across private organizations. As part of my office's open data initiative, HHS is dedicated to freeing up that data and making it usable. And we've barely scratched the surface of what data can tell us about health. We live in a world where a vast amount of computing power is dedicated to all kinds of things. Things like determining the, the names of people and pets and photographs that we take automatically and for free. Yet most doctors don't have simple data and analytics to support better diagnosis and treatment at the point of care. Data and analytics are crucial to solving pressing health issues. And your input today will enrich our larger strategy to leverage the power of data at HHS. My team has done tremendous research and work on changing how data is shared internally and externally at HHS to enable data-driven solutions. And data-driven innovation is crucial. It's a crucial component of what we're doing here today. 
And we recognize that business as usual will not suffice. And that's especially true for Lyme. Now I'd like to mention a few different things going on today. Uh, first, you may have noticed the mural over here. And um, this will be your journey throughout the day and will serve as a place where we can capture the group's inputs and recommendations. And it encompasses a chronological timeline of efforts to combat Lyme disease. As the day goes on, I believe it will, be, it will very neatly illustrate um, uh, the, the day. So uh, please be sure to keep your eye on it as the day proceeds. And in the back, I thought I would mention that um, um, Jim Daniel, Jim, can you raise your hand? Uh, Jim Daniel from my team will be leading discussions about taking an all hazards approach to electronic health records and some of the interesting overlap with Lyme disease. Better integration of public health data for use in clinical decision support could greatly improve how we diagnose Lyme disease in the future. And this all hazards approach aims to solve another data problem where we need to paint a full data picture of each patient so that we can properly treat them. And uh, earlier, I mentioned the importance of convening stakeholders to solve pressing issues. The value of bringing together different voices and perspectives will be evident in today's dialogue, no doubt. We have a diverse group of stakeholders in the room here today to share expertise and insight, and I'm grateful for everybody's attendance because we need an all hands on deck approach. I wanna to close today uh, by uh, acknowledging the hard work of a lot of people and, and the contributions of folks. I know our team, uh, especially Kristen Honey, has been working around the clock to make sure that things run smoothly today. Also, this event would not have been possible without the generous support and dedication from so many of our partners, like the Stephen and Alexandra Cohen Foundation, the Center for Open Data Enterprise, the Bay Area Lyme Foundation, and Ensemble. And finally, I'd like to thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for contributing your time and your talent and your knowledge to this event. And now I'd like to introduce the Deputy Secretary of HHS, Eric Hargan. Mr. Hargan knows this building very well, having previously served at HHS during the George W. Bush administration. And as a lawyer in private practice, he focused on healthcare regulation and spent time teaching law at Loyola in Chicago. And I must say, I haven't met anybody at HHS with such broad knowledge and deep understanding of how things work across HHS and how regulations and, and policy really drive the work that we do here every day. So with that, please welcome Deputy Secretary Eric Hargan. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, introduction, Ed. Uh, I want to thank everyone at HHS headquarters here today who's come together to discuss Lyme innovation. I'd also like to thank those of you who are watching on the live stream. Uh, for those of you watching, know that I am honored to have your attention here today. Just about a year ago, I was on this same stage for a different CTO event, the HHS Opioid Codathon. I had the pleasure of speaking to a diverse set of stakeholders that included engineers, data scientists, providers, patients, public health leaders. It was a 24-hour codathon, so there were a lot more jeans and sweatshirts uh, out in this audience. Uh, frankly, a lot more pizza boxes uh, over the evening. Uh, the, the diverse group there came together for 24 hours for one shared purpose, to come up with data-driven solutions to address the opioid epidemic. Uh, and we are just on the edge, I think, of the first uh, result of that, the first uh, technology that's going to be uh, pushed out from that, so a little about, about a year from one of the winning teams to move from the Codathon, from actually being out here just batting around ideas to having something real that's going to help drive some solutions on the opioid issue. Uh, so these uh, these convenings actually have can have some real practical effects, and I, and so we pay a lot of attention to groups like this and events like this. 
Uh, it's my pleasure, of course, today to address another collaborative group of leaders who've come together to discuss how data can be used to develop innovative solutions to address Lyme disease. Last year in 2017, as I'm sure you know, 42,743 confirmed and probable cases of Lyme disease were reported to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention by state health departments in the District of Columbia. However, this number does not reflect every case of Lyme disease diagnosed in the United States every year. Recent estimates suggest that 300,000 Americans get Lyme disease every year, and trends are worsening. More cases of Lyme and other tick-borne diseases were reported in 2017 than ever before, and almost all states are impacted. Surveillance systems bring, provide vital information, but they don't capture every case. Because only a fraction of illnesses are reported, researchers need to estimate the total burden of illness to set public health goals, allocate resources, and measure the economic impact of disease. Data is a critical resource that can be used to address the many complexities surrounding Lyme disease. Data, especially when connected across disciplines and interoperable across organizations, is helping us understand complex health conditions. Lyme and tick-borne disease are such complex conditions, but we need your help. So I thank you all for taking time, all this time out of your busy schedules to discuss how public-private partnerships data, and the convening of diverse stakeholders can accelerate innovation to treat, prevent, and better diagnose Lyme and tick-borne diseases. A diversity of perspectives can help us unlock ideas for new therapies and diagnostics. Uh, and it's particularly important here because a lot of times inside government, we have a lot of data, we have a lot of experts, but we don't have all the data, we don't have all the experts. It's unwise for us to make what I call policy in a hothouse. Uh, we have to sort of open the doors here and make sure that we get perspectives from across the community to make sure that we have the broadest possible and the deepest possible understanding of what's going on out there. Uh, again, it's, it's a temptation for any one group to kind of close off these perspectives, but it's, I think, unwise in the long term. Uh, at HHS, we're taking a similar approach to another complex health issue, end-stage renal disease. For those of you who aren't familiar, for the 600,000 Americans with kidney failure, there are only two treatment options, transplant or dialysis. Life on dialysis can be debilitating physically, mentally, and socially, along with the physical impacts such as fatigue, lack of appetite, insomnia. Patients often deal with depression and difficulty sustaining a full lifestyle, be it familial, professional, or otherwise. And dialysis today doesn't look much different than it did decades ago. And we want to change that because patients deserve better. I mean, as I, as I say, like, if you took a patient on dialysis in 1978 and brought them forward 40 years to today, their life would be very similar. The technology would be very similar to what it was then. If you took a patient who had cancer in 1978 and brought them forward 40 years, it's radically different. In this country, in some areas, the advances in science and technology have been startlingly good. And in some areas, they've been very spotty. Uh, and we need to unlock the reasons why innovation happens in a certain area and doesn't happen in other areas. And that's one of the things that we are trying to address here at the department, is kind of the role of innovation, why it happens, where we see it happening and where we don't see it happening. And so that's why the role of some of these areas where we're trying to concentrate and put a spotlight on particular complex diseases and the role of innovation are very important to us. And that's why, in partnership with the American Society of Nephrology, we've created KidneyX, as Ed had mentioned. KidneyX envisions the next generation of therapies to treat, prevent, and diagnose kidney disease, and challenges entrepreneurs and other innovators to think boldly and transform the future of kidney care. As I like to tell researchers, I don't think there's anything magic about the kidney. Uh, there's nothing magic about that sort of baffles science and technology for being able to address those issues. The first Kidney X Prize imagines how we can redesign dialysis. The first prize will award $2.6 million to multiple winners across two phases. Uh, similar to what I see happening in the room here today, our goal is to seed transformative ideas from both likely and unlikely innovators, with a focus on supporting a collaborative and vibrant community that continue to push the boundaries of innovation. Our hope is that scientists, engineers, entrepreneurs, patients and clinicians will work together to develop solutions, whether it's wearable, implantable, 
something entirely different. With KidneyX, we want to create an ecosystem for more innovative product development. And I think we will. For complex health issues like Lyme and tick-borne diseases, the most expedient and successful interventions will involve not only the federal government, they involve all of us working together towards this common purpose to prevent, control, and cure Lyme disease. Together, we can harness the power, resources, commitment, and innovation that we have across all sectors, whether it's industry, academia, nonprofit organizations, the local, the state, the governmental sector, and the private sector. Collaborations like we see here today are critical to advancing new solutions and evolving healthcare in America. To effectively address tick-borne diseases in the United States, we must allow for the intersection of data, technology, and public health to promote innovative solutions. Most importantly, health innovation has to be patient-driven. Patients should have the opportunity to provide meaningful input on the design of any potential solutions. And these approaches must be undertaken through channels that promote and safeguard scientific and methodologic rigor. They have to be they have to both work, but they also have to be sustainable over the long term. And having the patient's perspective on these things is what I think ultimately informs the sustainability in the long term of any of the, the innovations that are developed. So thank you again for being here today for the Live Innovation Roundtable. It is a significant time commitment, so we're extremely grateful you brought your considerable expertise and your time to the table. I look forward to hearing more about what comes out of today's Lyme Innovation Roundtable discussions. And thank you all for the opportunity to speak with you here today. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Morgan. Appreciate it. Um, so before moving forward, just want to ground us in what we're doing here today. Why are we here? Um, but before we dive into that, let's give another round of applause to the leadership of HHS that's creating this opportunity. This has never happened before, and i um, very excited all of you are here as a part. Our shared purpose today is to strengthen collaborations by harnessing the power of the, the people in this room, harnessing this collaboration, data-driven innovation that we just heard about, and emerging technologies for Lyme and tick-borne diseases. As I mentioned earlier, there are very, very, very diverse people in this audience, and uh, not everyone comes from a Lyme disease background. And that is intentional. And that is called uh, innovation across silos, which is my favorite word in the world, exaptation. Exaptation is a wonky world for, word from genetics. It basically means a trait evolved for one purpose. And then that trait obviously had some population fitness advantage or went to state in the population. Then for some other completely unrelated reason, another even more valuable fitness advantage happens from that trait that evolved for a different purpose. And this other fitness advantage, the secondary advantage, is way more impactful, way more of a benefit to the population than the reason it originally evolved. So this word, exaptation, that was in genetics for a long time, no one paid attention, attention to it, except for evolutionary biologists, um, got exapted. The word was exapted by the business literature. They took this idea and repurposed it. And the reason why is if you look at genius, if you look at transformative change, it is not a new idea most of the time. It is an old idea that gets repurposed in a new area. So I have no doubt that we have some of the solutions to Lyme and tick-borne diseases here today in this room. And we need to have the ideas flow across the table and allow that exaptation from one discipline. Maybe we've solved uh, this challenge through precision oncology, but those lessons, those ideas haven't yet made it to tick-borne disease. So today, let's exact those ideas and have exaptation and a free flow with all of your perspectives together. And with that, we want to make sure that you not only get to know the people at your table. You have a long day, three breakout sessions, with about 10 people that you will get to know very, very well. But part of the value of today is the amazing expertise and the amazing diversity in the room. So we want to take a few minutes now and go around the room and see who is here with us today. So Katerina has a microphone. Then she is going to walk around like a talk show host and not give it to you. And you are going to say your name and your affiliation 
very quickly. And we're going to hear from absolutely everyone because you've probably emailed with these people or you've read their papers and now you can put a face to who they are. Do you want me to stand up? Okay. Hi, I'm Holiday Goodrow and I'm with the LiveLine Foundation and the Tick Tracker app. Please do stand up. Oh, yes. Oh, and well. face Ali Arab, I'm an associate professor of statistics, Georgetown University. Monty Skall, I'm the executive director of the National Capital Lyme Disease Association here in the metropolitan area. Thank you. Hi, uh, Joel Gurin, Center for Open Data Enterprise. Oops. David Gaines, I'm the uh, public health entomologist for the Virginia Department of Health. Debbie Seem, uh, I work with the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health, and I support the Tick-Borne Disease Working Group. Ben Beer, Deputy Director at CDC's Division of Vector-Borne Diseases. Angel Davey, I'm Program Manager for the Tick-Borne Disease Research Program at the Congressionally Directed Medical Research Programs, which is part of the DOD. Temi Lola Afalabi, Research and Communications Intern at the Center for Open Data Enterprise. Oh, oh. Kit Teague, Chief Operating Officer for VHA Innovation Ecosystem, uh, Department of Veterans Affairs. Seo Tong from Smiling Health. We pull data from Jake Charles. Robin Nadalny, uh, I run the Tick-Borne Disease Laboratory at the Army Public Health Center. I'm Jeff Stoffer. I'm with the Live Lyme Foundation and Tick Tracker. Chris Shubashevsky, U.S. Biologic. Kim Sharetta, I'm with HHS within the at the ASPR, the Assistant Secretary of Preparedness and Response within BARDA, lots of acronyms, acronyms, Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority within DRIVE, the Division of Research, Innovation, and Ventures. I'm Holly Hooks. I'm a Policy Specialist with CDC's Division of Vector-Borne Diseases. I'm Pat Smith. I'm President of the National Nonprofit Lyme Disease Association. Sam Shore, Associate Clinical Professor, GW University, Immediate Past President at ILADS, and Chair of the Loudoun County Lyme Commission. Greg Skall, Lombelbond Dickinson, and Counsel to the National Capital Lyme Disease Association. Hi, I'm Haley Riley. I attend University of Maryland College Park and majoring in Public Health Science. Jacob Lewis with the Center for Open Data Enterprise. Sue Visser, I'm the Associate Director for Policy for the Division of Vector-Borne Diseases at CDC. John Alcott, uh, Johns Hopkins Lyme Disease Research Center. Uh, Lance Leota, George Mason University, Center for Applied Proteomics and Molecular Medicine. Tim Salati, Chief Scientific Officer of Global Lyme Alliance. Hi, Megan Delaney. I work for the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs, and I'm also a patient. Theo Knanenburg, ISB, Institute for Systems Biology. Maliha Ilias. I'm with the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. I'm the Lyme Disease Program Officer. Come this way. Hi. Hi. David Marin. I'm a statistician at the VA. Caleb Bruda, I'm with the Center for Open Data Enterprise. Bob, Bob Mozzini, Translational Medicine Group and President-Elect of ILANS. Liz Horn, Principal Investigator, Lyme Disease Biobank. Ben Nemzer, Stephen and Alexandra Cohen Foundation. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Lise Nigervich, I'm a pediatric ER physician from Boston Children's and founder of PD LimeNet. Karen Vanderhoof Borschner, I'm a healthcare lawyer and president of the Lyme Disease Foundation. Jyotsnasha Hygienics. Enid Haller, Lyme Center of Martha's Vineyard. David Roth, Project Lyme. 
Christine Lorenzen. I'm a Lyme disease, ad Lyme disease advocate and patient. Jim Berger, designated federal officer for the Tick-Borne Disease Working Group. Jim Ryan, scientist at Progene DX, a biotech startup developing clinical diagnostics for biotoxin exposure. I am Rich Horowitz. I'm a member of the HHS Tick Point Disease Working Group and medical director of the Hudson Valley Healing Arts Center. I'm Dorothy Leland. I'm uh, director of communications for LymeDisease.org. I am the mother of someone who has Lyme disease. Hi. I'm Leanne Soltyshak. I'm a recovered patient, an advocate, and I work in industry as a commercialization strategist for Silverleaf Consulting. Hi, Matteo Danieletto. I'm a software engineer at Monsanto Hospital. I am Lyndon Hu. I'm professor of microbiology at Tufts University School of Medicine. I'm Susan Green. I'm an attorney, and I'm legislative counsel for NatCap Lyme. I'm Noel Gerald. I'm a biologist at FDA, Center for Devices and Radiological Health. <clears throat> Evan Golub, and I'm building a digital platform to connect people with Lyme and related chronic conditions. All right. Sorry. My name is Rich Shoemaker from the Center for Research on Biotoxin-Associated Illnesses. Nicole Malakowski, United States Air Force, retired patient and advocate. I'm Wendy Adams, the Research Grant Director at Bay Area Lyme Foundation. Major Jordan Coburn, Armed Forces Pest Management Board. I'm Tara D'Amelia. I work in communications for Bay Area Lyme Foundation. Hi, Brian Schwartz uh, from Johns Hopkins University, Departments of Environmental Health, Epidemiology, and Medicine, and also the Geisinger Health System. Uh, Jason Bobe from Icon School of Medicine in New York City. Andy Kogelnick, Director of the Open Medicine Institute in Silicon Valley. George Church, Professor at Harvard and MIT, Technology Developer. Joseph Jemsek, a Physician, Jemsek Specialty Clinic, treating Lyme borreliosis complex for patients from around the world. Sam Perdue, I'm a bacteriology program officer at the National Institutes of Health. Julia Skapik, health information officer at um, Cognitive Medical Systems. Dan Chaput, Health and Human Services, Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. Sanja Schweig, founder of the California Center for Functional Medicine, also Climb Health, and on the Scientific Advisory Board for the Bay Area Lyme Foundation. Sorry. Uh, Mark Dunnigan, VP of uh, Health Informatics at SmartLink Health. Colin McGoodwin, Program Officer for Public Health Policy with the Infectious Diseases Society of America. Hi, I'm Chris Roth, FDA, uh, Center for Devices, Office of In Vitro Diagnostics. Uh, hi, Walter Suarez with Kaiser Permanente. I'm Julia Murphy. I serve as a state public health veterinarian for the Virginia Department of Health. Hi, I'm Catherine Feldman. I'm with the MITRE Corporation and formerly with the Maryland Department of Health. Hi, I'm Anne Marie Hirsch. I'm an epidemiologist at Geisinger Health System. Hi, I'm Robbie Barbero from Ceres Nanosciences. Hi, I'm Adriana Marquez, Intramural NAID. Hi, I'm Kristen Vanderhoof Forschner. I'm an assistant and media manager at the Lyme Disease Foundation. Hi, I'm Rachel Abbey. I'm with the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT. Okay. Did I miss anyone? I'm Adam Caritas with Ensemble. And I'm Katerina Rabello with the Center for Open Data Enterprise. Thank you, everyone. Very, very diverse group. 
Um, and for our next uh, speaker, we have Adam Bowler, who is a senior advisor to the Secretary of HHS and the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services Deputy Administrator and the Director of the Innovation Center. He joined CMS in April 2018. Adam is widely regarded as an innovative leader in the private sector and has designed and implemented new patient-focused approaches to healthcare delivery. Let's welcome Adam. Oh, he's not here yet. Well, <laughs> um, we might rejigger the agenda a bit. Um, this is what happens when you uh, work with HHS leadership and principals. You work around their schedule, schedule. so we will be a bit agile. Um, our next speaker, then, is Dr. George Church. And Dr. George Church is a professor at Harvard and MIT. He's a co-author of 450 papers, 95 patent publications, and the book Regenesis. Dr. Church developed methods used in the first genome sequence in 1994 um, and genome recording and million-fold cost reduction since. He co-initiated the Brain Initiative in 2011 and the Genome Projects in, in 1984 and 2005. Um, and this is to provide and interpret the world's only open access personal precision medicine data. Welcome, Dr. Church. Right, that summarizes some of the technologies that we'd like to bring to bear on, uh, on Lyme. Uh, in particular, uh, we have a cohort that is uh, con consented and consentable for broad sharing, like Wikipedia, not, not uh, siloed. Um, we would like to be able to use some of those same technologies, same consenting methods here. We have technologies, we brought down the price of the genome sequencing and a variety of related sequencings from less, from more than $3 billion for a poor non-clinical grade genome uh, to now in the $300 to $600 range for the cost, the, uh, but the price to the individual is now $0 because we're recovering those costs from uh, either researchers or uh, providers that have to pay for um, Mendelian diseases. So either of those can allow you to get a zero-dollar genome, uh, and that um, uh, it comes along with a, a, a genetic counseling and interpretation, high-quality whole genome sequence that then can be <coughs> harnessed um, in this particular uh, venue for uh, finding exceptional individuals who are uh, resistant to Lyme. And that is not just uh, their inherited genome, but also the genome that varies from day to day, which is their immunome. We worked with uh, Steve Elledge, and, uh, who's at Harvard, and Uri Lacherson, who's now at Mount Sinai, on uh, technology that allows us to identify which antigens are your, your fluid, body fluids are reacting to and uh, to find uh, exceptional uh, antibodies that are uh, neutralizing. We have, and, and we're inspired for the Lyme community by our uh, experience in the HIV community, where uh, we have collaboratively worked with some of the leaders on finding neutralizing antibodies to HIV, and now have a new method uh, for delivering these neutralizing antibodies um, in the appropriate uh, body fluids um, as a a preventative measure at first uh, <clears throat> uh, by delivery by lactobacillus species. This is uh, going into clinical trials now. So the other way that you can find exceptional individuals to HIV, and by analogy, Lyme, is the immunome, which varies uh, from day to day, and, their, and your inherited genome. So there are individuals who, because of their inherited genome, are uh, resistant to HIV, uh, in, in particular the CCR5 double nulls, which are quite prevalent, up to 10 percent in certain European populations. And unless you've been living under a rock, you've probably heard of CCR5 recently. Um, anyway, we are inspired by those two examples, uh, inherited uh, resistance to HIV, which has been turned into a variety of different drugs, including molecules that attack CCR5 
and gene therapies in adults that, that, uh, that delete CCR5 and T cells, we'd like to make analog analogous uh, breakthroughs um, for either delivery of neutralizing antibodies or these uses of, 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 uh, of receptors, other means of being resistant um, to the diseases. Furthermore, there are uh, long-term impact of some of these infectious diseases, which can be autoimmune. One of the first applications that, that Yuri Laserson and Steve Elledge's group and we uh, applied um, the immunome technologies was to, to autoimmunity, and so we would like to be able to um, find the cause and effect relationship between um, antigens in the environment and, an and uh, antigens in your own body. Uh, as that's appropriate. And again, there are potential for uh, preventatives there. So uh, the, the other class of technologies that we've developed uh, include uh, a gene, not just reading DNA, reading your immunome and reading your genome, but also writing DNA, um, being able to use synthetic biology um, to do novel uh, approaches. I already mentioned one example of that is making lactobacillus to produce neutralizing antibodies in your body. This doesn't, this kind of short circuits the whole normal immune system and our ability to engineer um, uh, normal uh, flora and fauna in your body uh, uh, is, it can be leveraged here by synthetic uh, biology. We also do uh, gene therapy. Uh, that right now is one of the most expensive uh, approaches to therapeutics. A, a single dose of a gene therapy can be um, $700,000 or more, but we have seen this in <clears throat> many other technologies already mentioned. Gene, genome sequencing has come down by 10 million fold. Uh, we are working to do the same thing for, for gene therapy. I think by far the most uh, pr promising things that I'd like to collaborate with, I mean, here we're talking about uh, collaboration, is anybody who has any leads on getting, uh, finding exceptional individuals who are highly resistant to um, immune function, uh, uh, sorry, to, to, to Lyme disease or to autoimmune disease um, so that we can get them sequenced and their antibodies analyzed. I should mention that, that my, uh, one of my close collaborators on this uh, is here, Jason Bobe. He's been working with me for many years on uh, personalgenomes.org and openhumans.org, which are this uh, uh, previously mentioned open access uh, database, unique. And also uh, Ting Wu, um, a uh, Harvard professor who is particularly interested in, in human genetics and, and uh, exceptional individuals. So that's uh, all for now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Church. And now we've heard um, from a few different diseases where there's expertise that might lend itself to tick-borne disease. We have cancer, HIV, AIDS, and kidney, renal disease. Keep the ideas flowing. Uh, Adam Bowler is now her here. You already heard me read his introduction, so I won't repeat it. I will just say he is an amazing innovator that's come to HHS from the private sector and his a style of innovation puts patients front and center, patients first. And with that, welcome Adam Bowler. Well, thank you everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, I know everybody's pulled in a lot of different directions um, and it's nice that we can all come together. I do believe from my experience here at HHS, which is relatively short, uh, I've been here since April, but you learn that time in government uh, is like dog gear, so it feels like a lot longer. <laughs> uh, but it is through sessions like these that you collaborate with stakeholders where you do find innovation, um, and I think this is a critical area. So I really appreciate it, and I'm thrilled to be part of what is the first ever um, Lyme Innovation Roundtable at HHS. And, and I want to commend the Secretary, um, the CTO's office, for recognizing this issue. Um, it's not one that I think is out in the public quite enough, um, and it's one where we need to make progress. So I'm super excited about it. Um, I, I want to uh, tell you about my role. I really wear two hats um, in the government here. Um, the first is I am the advisor to the Secretary of HHS, to Secretary Azar, on value-based care and transformation. 
Uh, my job there is to advise the secretary on new directions that we should take um, to make a difference in health care. Uh, and at the end of the day, one thing that I really like about my job is that I have no competing priorities beyond one, and that's the patient. Um, our job is to figure out how to improve quality, to reduce cost, and to drive choice and access for patients. Um, and that is our sole job and all we focus on. Um, and it's nice to have that clarity of focus in a role. Um, my second hat is as the director for the Center of Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. Um, our job there is to test models. Um, I think when the Innovation Center was set up uh, a while back, I think they were very prescient in thinking and saying, hey, if we're going to see how things work, we need to have the ability to try and to test. Um, and what we do is in Medicare and in Medicaid, we try and we test things out. Um, we take a lot of feedback from external stakeholders, um, from various associations, uh, direct from patients, um, from PTAC, uh, which is a, a physician advisory board, um, and we implement those changes to try to, to look at things. And again, a focus is how do you create value? And our definition of value is better outcomes at lower cost. Um, I think the future state that we're moving toward is a more effective patient-centered health system, um, and this is also what we're here to talk about today, which is a patient-centered approach uh, to Lyme disease. Um, the, the scope and the personal impact that's caused by Lyme disease is no secret um, to this group for sure, uh, so I won't belabor that, um, but I will say um, that the fact that the symptoms of chronic Lyme are so severe that there's no validated treatment for patients is a scary thought. Um, and I think that's one of the things we're here to address. A more effective healthcare system will address Lyme disease earlier, um, provide more and effective treatment options, um, and address some of these se se the severe symptoms of chronic um, Lyme disease. Um, I know that we can do better. We know that we can do better. Um, and it's forums like these that give us the direct ideas. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to um, go in a, a glass tower here. Um, we need to listen to people that know um, and listen to what is out there in the field that makes a difference. Um, so I'm very excited to hear the output of today, and I think we're very excited at HHS and at CMS to learn and to put some of these uh, practices um, into broad play publicly. So thank you very much for being here. Really great to have CMS leadership also on board, uh, really bringing HHS, the different, many different divisions and over 80,000 employees together, which is great. Um, for our next speaker, we have Dr. Andy Kogelnik from the Open Medicine Institute. Um, and he'll be pulling a little bit on the thread that we heard from earlier from Dr. Church on open source, open access, open data, open science. So basically unlocking information for the world and advancing science um, to, for, uh, for society. Um, so Dr. Kogelnik is a director, a founder and director of the Open Medicine Institute. This is a community-centered, independent precision medicine organization in California that spun out of Stanford in 2009. As a physician engineer at the intersection of genomics and clinical medicine, the Open Medicine Institute and Andy have successfully driven forward a new collabor collaborative data-driven model for patient-centric clinical research networks. So not just in California, but networks that are replicated across the country. Um, this is leveraging a clinical multi-omics approach across patients, physicians, government agencies, industry, and nonprofit foundations. And I have to say, Dr. Kogelnik is one of the rare clinicians who sees patients in the trenches and can also talk all the wonky data informatics stuff and the data architecture. So with that, thank you, Dr. Kogelnik, for joining us. Uh, thank you. So. Um, Part of my goal here was to really start to drive a conversation around collaborating and data and bridge what George was talking about on the technology side and I think what we'll hear about from uh, the next speaker as well in terms of collaborative data access for, for patients. So 
At Open Medicine, um, we're trying a different approach where we're really pulling together uh, patients, physicians, data scientists, and, and laboratorians. Next slide, please. Do I have, oh, I've got a clicker. Um, so uh, just a word about us. We are uh, uh, in a 104,000 square foot uh, pharma pharmaceutical facility where we've been able to pull together uh, lab resources, including a CLIA lab, multi-omic approach in our lab, but also with lots of different partners. We have a nationwide phlebotomy network where we're drawing samples not only from Lyme patients, but from healthies and all kinds of other diseases. Um, and we've got collaborations with academia, with CDC and uh, industry, uh, other, and lots of other community physicians and, and patients. And we've built an IT infrastructure around that to try to help uh, integrate lots of that information and, and continue to drive that uh, forward. We're also opening uh, in January and February a tick-borne illness clinical and research center in northern Wisconsin in the heart of uh, uh, tick country with the Howard Young Foundation. So we sit in the middle of Silicon Valley, and we see technology floating around us all the time. So part of what we tried to do was start to think about how we can bring together uh, social uh, media uh, type of information with biotechnology information, uh, with any other information that's collected anywhere across the clinical spectrum. And that turns out is a real big challenge. And I, I give a whole series of other talks where I, as a computer scientist and as a physician, I can say that physicians, we're, we're sort of data stupid. We don't know what to do, and we have a very limited arm to collect data, and we're trying to really change that paradigm so that we can, and many of people in this room, I think, are at the, the tip of that sphere in really using good data, particularly across complex diseases like Lyme disease, uh, to drive a health and disease revolution. So access to data, I think, is exploding uh, in many ways, but we still have a very limited use of those uh, in the clinical setting, but I think more and more uh, different groups are really showing how that data can drive optimal care and really change the paradigm of, of treatment as well as diagnosis for many patients. When I was in medical school, I, would, I, I sort of dreamt of a timeline of a patient, uh, something like this, but I never saw it. Uh, so we had to go and build it. Uh, but this is a, a chronic Lyme patient uh, who went through all kinds of treatments on the top and we did all kinds of deep dive multi-omic measurements on them, so each of those dots actually represents tens of thousands of data points around that patient, from uh, metabolomics to microbiome to uh, single cell uh, RNA sequencing. Um, and then on the bottom, uh, what was actually happening to them in terms of symptomatic treatment. And this is obviously a, a summary uh, of this patient, but imagine if you had this kind of resolution across thousands or tens of thousands of patients. It becomes a really valuable tool and really a, a trove of data that tells us a lot about that individual and of one, but can also potentially start to let us bring lots of different patients from lots of different groups together to find some answers. Uh, so to continue on that uh, note, we can take that data and create immunologic profiles like what George was talking about, and George, I'm, I'm coming back at you for that free genome, um, uh, but we can uh, create a profile of their immune system, which is over on the right here, along with all kinds of clinical parameters. It doesn't project so well here, but the, the bottom slide is actually an RNA expression slide of before and after uh, treatment for a, a bunch of folks, and if it was a little darker in the room, you'd see that there's two populations there that are segregating beautifully, so uh, the beginnings, I would say, of, of a potential diagnostic tool. One key to, I think, this whole data revolution has to be longitudinal data sampling. All too many times in medicine we do single time point studies or we do a study and then the, that patient is basically lost to follow up. So part of what we're trying to push is not only that diversity of data that the, that the uh, CTO and the secretary were talking about, but a diversity of geography and a diversity of time sampling as well as obviously a diversity of technology sampling like uh, the technologies that, that Dr. Church was talking about. So how do we sample broad across a community. When, uh, when we started, when we first announced that we were doing this uh, Wisconsin Center, um, we uh, did some uh, community events, and we expected maybe 20 people to show up. Well, over 100 people showed up at the first one, and over 200 people showed up in this tiny little community uh, uh, for the second event that we did, because the first one was such a success. 
Um, so we instantly got 300 patients from across that geography in that community that we're now resampling over time. Uh, some of them have Lyme disease already, some of them were healthy controls, but that, that longitudinal sampling is really key to understanding what, what's going on in that patient you know, before they got ill, as they get ill, as they go down a correct treatment path versus an incorrect one. And how do we start to use that for the benefit of every physician out there trying to figure out these patients and, of course, for the patient at the end of the day? So really, again, this is really, I think, a conversation about how do we take lots of different resources and, and pull them together. Uh, there's, there's so many different uh, tools out there in, just in this room alone, and I think it's really phenomenal that, that you guys have been able to pull them all together in, in one room, and there's, there's so many more out there, but we really do need to, to bring them all together in, in a, a comprehensive view, because at the end of the day, it's, it's, it all comes back to the patient, and frankly, in Lyme disease, we're, we're not doing a great job, but I think the, the tide is starting to turn, so thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Kogelnik. And um, for our last speaker of the day, we have a video. Um, but before diving into the video, just want to point out the, uh, the West Coast Open Medicine Institute originating out of Stanford that we just heard about. And then Dr. Church's talk about Harvard at Mount Sinai. We have East Coast and West Coast, uh, big data and all the omics. They don't yet talk to each other. But the Steve and Alexander Cohen Foundation and their grants they've given out have really pushed open science, open data, open source, and in a responsible way, protecting patients' privacy, being able to share that information across institutions. So one of the hopes we have for today is that the West Coast and the East Coast will talk to each other, and that back-end IT infrastructure can become interoperable. And then over time, patients' data will pool, and we will have more and more big data to look at and discover these complex patterns that everyone working on their own, we would not see. So for the next presentation, it will be the patient, um, the patient perspective. And we're going to end with a video from uh, Lorraine Johnson of LymeDisease.org, who was unable to be here in person, except it's so important to put the patients front and center. We wanted to make sure that my Lyme data and 11,000 crowdsourced patient um, uh, health records that patients themselves have volunteered are part of this discussion. We do have other representatives from LymeDisease.org and many nonprofits here, as well as patients in the room. So they are part of today's discussion where we're soliciting and asking for individual input, individual feedback and stuff. We recognize not everybody could be here today. Space is limited and with this community of Lyme and tick-borne diseases, many people are too sick to travel or don't have the financial means to travel. So if you're out there listening to the live stream and want to get involved, you can personally email me. My address is Kristen, K-R-I-S-T-E-N, dot honey, H-O-N-E-Y, at hhs.gov, and we will involve you in the Lyme innovation conversation going forward. We really hope you'll be a part. And with that, um, we're going to end the morning session after Lorraine's video. Thank you to all our online viewers who have watched and been a part we look forward to hearing from you. And Lorraine Johnson, she's a JD MBA and a chief executive officer of LymeDisease.org and the principal investigator of its patient registry and research platform, MyLymeData. MyLymeData has enrolled over 12,000 patients, I guess 11,000 more since the last time I talked to Lorraine, uh, sorry, 1,000 more since the last time I spoke with Lorraine. So 12,000 patients have submitted their healthcare data. She's published over 40 peer-reviewed articles on Lyme disease, and she served on a number of government healthcare policy panels, including the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, PCORI, and the Cochrane Collaboration. Let's give a round of applause for Lorraine Johnson. Good morning. I'm delighted to be able to present to you today LymeDisease.org has been collecting patient-generated information in big data surveys for over 10 years, and our patient registry, MyLymeData, has enrolled over 12,000 patients so far. What I want to talk about today is how, given the grindingly slow pace of traditional research in Lyme disease, 
and the inaction of most policymakers. It has become essential that we build the research capacity of patients and develop the levers to create sustainable change and accelerate research. To do this, we must embrace big data, precision medicine, and patient-centered research. So this chart, which is derived from an article by Goswami, compares the number of clinical trials conducted in different infectious diseases. And what you see is this enormous research gap between Lyme and other infectious diseases. So let me put this in context. The CDC estimates that there are over 300,000 cases of Lyme disease each year. That's eight times the number of new HIV AIDS cases each year. But while HIV AIDS holds the number one slot on the chart, with the most research studies, Lyme disease trails behind leprosy, which, you know, if you Google leprosy, one commonly asked question is, does it exist in the United States any longer? And it does, but there are only 200 new cases a year. So really just no comparison in terms of the magnitude, 300,000 cases of Lyme disease and the research funding that's being provided. And the last clinical trials for the treatment of late chronic Lyme disease was funded over 15 years ago with no new research in the pipeline. We are not even addressing the most basic questions, like how many patients with late or chronic Lyme disease were not diagnosed early when the treatments work the best? Or can we identify a subgroup of patients who are high treatment responders like they do in cancer and tuberculosis and learn from their success? But if you don't fund, you don't find. So we need to make funding clinical research in Lyme disease a priority and to fund it proportionately to its prevalence and incidence. And we need to address the two most urgent research needs in Lyme disease, preventing people from developing late chronic Lyme disease and curing those who do. 70% of those in the My Lyme data registry were not diagnosed until at least six months after symptom onset. That means they had late Lyme disease. Treatment approaches developed decades ago leave too many patients ill. 35% in Alcott's study had persisting symptoms after treatment of early Lyme, and those diagnosed late have far greater treatment failure rates. These patients remain ill, and most in our surveys report being ill for 10 or more years, until they are cured or die. And generally, this isn't a disease that kills most patients. It just makes them wish they were dead and robs them of their ability to be productive members of society for a long, long time. And this makes it a costly problem to ignore. According to a CDC study, the cost of late chronic Lyme disease is 12 times higher than the cost of treating early disease, about $24,000 per person per year when adjusted for inflation. And the traditional way of doing research one sequential randomized control trial followed by another takes too long, costs too much, and doesn't apply to most people, as Rob Califf at the FDA points out. Janet Woodcock, also at the FDA, takes it a step further at a recent industry panel saying, I believe the clinical trial system is broken. I do not believe it serves the interests of patients. The NIH-funded trials took 2.5 to 5 years to complete recruitment alone. And most patients were screened out. For example, in Klempner, they screened out 97% of those who apply. But look at the top bar, one of our published studies, where it took six months to recruit over 3,000 patients. So today, with big data, we can and must accelerate the pace of clinical research and include real-world patients. But it's important to recognize that research orphan diseases like Lyme disease require more targeted, concerted research efforts. It requires that Lyme communities shoulder more of the research burden early on by collaborating with others to build a knowledge base, identify biomarkers, and treatment endpoints. And this approach accelerates the research process so that industry is stepping into the disease later in the process when many of the challenges have been identified and resolved. De this de-risks the investment of time and money that industry must expend to develop better diagnostics and more effective treatments. Dr. Stephen Groff, who until his recent retirement a few years ago headed the Office of Rare Disease Research for the NIH, shows us how to develop a research engine. In his process, patient registries play a vital role by linking with biorepositories, 
helping develop the disease knowledge base, shaping clinical trial hypotheses, speeding up recruitment times, expediting FDA approval, and reducing the burden of post-approval studies. Patient registries play a pivotal role in Groff's research engine because patients have access to sources of information that other stakeholders do not. They are the monkeys in the middle who hold the key to unlocking data silos, such as electronic health records, insurance records, biorepository sample results, lab results, and of course, the information that can only be gleaned from patients, their symptoms and their response to treatment. So the bottom line is that patients have more complete information about their health than any other stakeholder. And as Eric Topol, editor-in-chief at Medscape, points out, given the appropriate tools, patients represent the true blockbuster potential for improving outcomes. So Lyme disease has been conducting big data research using patient-generated data for over 10 years. We published our first study in Access to Care in 2011, and in 2014, we published our Quality of Life study. In 2015, we launched My Lyme Data, our patient registry and research platform, and with over 12,000 patients enrolled, today it is the largest observational study of Lyme disease ever conducted, and actually one of the largest patient-driven registries in the nation for any disease. We have patients enrolled from every state in the nation and have con collected over 2.5 million data points. We're collaborating with researchers from the University of Washington and from UCLA. The UCLA researchers were awarded a grant from the National Science Foundation to pursue their research in big data analytic techniques using data from the registry. We have also collaborated with the National Disease Research Interchange, the leading source of research tissues in the nation, and with one of the sponsors of this conference, the Bay Area Lyme Foundation on a tissue biorepository. And this type of collaboration is essential to build out a big data research engine and accelerate research in Lyme disease. This year, we published our first study using registry data. And as you can see, these efforts align with Groff's research engine components. The Lyme community now has a patient registry that is working with researchers and collaborating with the NDRI and BELF on a tissue biorepository toward a goal of identifying biomarkers for the disease. And I mentioned that we just published our first study based on data from the registry that focuses on another component of the engine, the development of clinical treatment endpoints. So the outcome measure to determine success in past treatment trials for late chronic Lyme disease has been average treatment response. But average treatment response is inherently flawed as an outcome measure because it ignores individual treatment response variation. Think of it this way. If one person gets better and another gets worse, the responses cancel each other out on average. And other diseases like cancer and tuberculosis identify and learn from high treatment responders. They're called super responders. But to do this, you need large samples, and you need to be able to really hone in on individual treatment response variation at a highly granular level to identify different subgroups of patients and how they respond. So we used a widely validated outcome measure called the Global Rating of Change Scale. You simply ask a patient, would you say that since you started treatment, you are better, worse, or unchanged? And those who said that they were better or worse are asked, how much better or worse, on a scale ranging from hardly better at all to a very great deal better. And on average, there was not much treatment response for the group as a whole. But individual treatment response varied widely. And because the sample was so large, close to 4,000, and because the question was so granular, essentially a 15-point Likert scale, we could really look at treatment variation within subgroups. And this allowed us to identify a group of high treatment responders, about 34 percent, who reported improving moderately to a very great deal better. Identifying high treatment responders is important so that we can learn from their success and look at the factors that may have contributed to their success, for example, time to diagnosis or type of treatment. And it is also the first step in moving Lyme disease towards personalized medicine and individualized care. So one key value of this global rating of change scale outcome measure is that it can be asked by a patient registry, 
by a healthcare provider or by a researcher in a controlled trial. This means that it can bridge different types of research and create interoperability of data, which helps fuel the research engine we are trying to build to accelerate research in Lyme disease. Let me conclude by saying that if you are a patient who is not enrolled in MyLyme data, please enroll today. Visit us at mylymedata.org. If you are a researcher who wants to collaborate with us, please contact me directly. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to present at this roundtable.